Scripture says, amen. Are we at Matthew chapter 9? Amen. We have verse 27. Amen. Let's read verses 27 through 31 together. And when Jesus departed thence, two blind men followed him, crying and said, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. And when he was come into the house, the blind men came to him. And Jesus saith unto them, Believe ye that I am able to do this? They said unto him, Yea, Lord. Then touched he their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it unto you. And their eyes were open, and Jesus straightly charged them, saying, See that no man know it. But they, when they were departed, spread abroad his fame in all that country. You got to understand, Jesus know what he's doing. Because he said, don't go tell nobody. He was using what I call reverse psychology on them. Because if he says, go tell everybody, they won't say nothing. But as soon as he said, he said don't go tell somebody, you know, I, I just can't keep it to myself. And so they went out and they shared what the Lord had done for them. But he asked the question, do you believe I can do this? Do you believe I can do this? So for a few moments, I'd like to share from this topic, theme, or subject, do you have the faith? Do you have the faith? Amen. Do you have the faith? Again, you know I love it when we're able to share the word of the Lord together. So if you don't mind, look to your neighbor, to your left, or to your right, and say, neighbor, the pastor's going to share today. Do you have the faith? Look at somebody on the other side. If you don't mind, say, neighbor, the pastor's going to share today. Do you have the faith? I see people on the walls looking over their shoulders. I guess they didn't want to talk to themselves. Neighbor? Me? Do I have the faith? Do you have the faith? Let me start off, if you will, by asking a few questions. Number one, do you believe that God can do anything but fail? Y'all sounded kind of weak on me. Do you believe that God can do anything but fail? Do you believe that God can handle any situation you might be going through? Do you believe that whatever God has promised you, that he's got the power to make sure that it arrives in your life? Oh, y'all got real quiet on me in that one. Do you believe he can bring it to pass? I need, I need a witness today. I need a witness today. Because you see, if you can answer yes to these questions, then you can also say that you have faith in God. Because you believe he can do exactly what he said he could do. But in order to know that God can do what he says he will do, you and I, we must know him for ourselves. You, you can't rely on somebody else's relationship with the Lord. You've got to know him for yourself. You know, it's all right to hear the report of others and to know that God handled their situations and their circumstances for them. But it's another thing altogether to know God for yourself. Amen. For your faith to operate in full effect. There's a few things that we all must know. That is, that according to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Because you see, when you know that everything has its beginnings in God, he's the one you can put your faith in. That according to Psalms number 90 and verse 2, it says, From everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Because when you know that time has no power over God, he's the one that you can put your trust in. 
You know, they say, he may not come when you want him. But he's always what? Right on time. We don't like spending a lot of times in the struggle. And people say the struggle is real. Well, I'm going to tell you something. Life is real. We, we live in a real life. We have a real enemy. We have a real savior who's got power over that real enemy. And one day that real enemy and all of his followers are going to spend eternity in a real lake of fire. And when you know Jesus Christ, you don't have to worry about the lake of fire. You know, you, you know that Jesus has the power because of your faith in him, your belief in him, and the fact that you have accepted him as Lord and Savior. You know you will spend eternity with him and not in the lake of fire. Few things we need to know uh, that according to Luke chapter 1 and verse 37 it says, For with God nothing shall be impossible. Nothing, with God, nothing shall be impossible. Because you see, when you know, when you know that there's nothing too hard for God, He's the one that you can put your faith in. And these central truths are important for us to know. Because we need to know that God is able to do what nobody else can do. Help us, Holy Ghost. It's easy for us to respond yes to having faith in the Lord. I need y'all to walk with me here. While we're sitting around other Christians who are comfortable and believe what we believe. Mm. But what about those times when things get rough? Things get thrown your way. Seem hard to handle and deal with. And there's nobody around. Nobody around. My question now is, what do you believe then? You see, it's easy for us to come in here and say hallelujah. Although some people might look at you a little funny. Because everybody don't praise the same way. But, but this is a, a good place to say hallelujah. But, but what about that time when you're having struggles outside the walls of the sanctuary? And, and people are around you and you don't know what their religious beliefs or convictions are. And something happens and you have out in, in, in society, if you will, you have a hallelujah moment. Something happens to you or something almost happens to you and all you want to say is hallelujah. But, but do you have enough faith in the Lord to say hallelujah regardless of who's around? We've got to be mindful of the fact that when it comes to our faith in the Lord, we can't only have faith in the Lord's house. We got to have faith everywhere. And having lived in San Diego for the past 27 years or so, I can tell you, you've got to have faith when you get in your car. And you're driving from destination to destination. And see, that's one of them times you might have a hallelujah moment. Because you see something happening and you turn and get out the way and, and right then and there, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, that we avoided an accident. So it's easy to say yes to faith when we're in the house of the Lord, but what do we believe or how do we respond when we're not in the house of the Lord? Because you see, there will be times and situations where you can't 
call somebody to get a prayer through. Yeah, we got cell phones and a lot of us don't even have house phones anymore. They call them landlines. There are times when stuff happens that we don't have time to call somebody and say, hey, listen, I'm having a rough moment. I need you to get a prayer through. See, that, that's the time when you get a prayer through. And the question is, who are you praying to? Because not every God, little G, has the power to handle your situation. You got to be able to call on the God, big G, who's got all power in his hands. So you've got to be able to get that prayer through for yourself. Why? It's because you have faith in the Lord. And when you're able to call upon the Lord and you know he's got the power to respond, you also know, Lord, however you do it, is good with me. Thank you, Lord. I need to put a bookmark right there. We, we got to understand something, brothers and sisters. God is not our gopher. I'm not talking about that little animal either. I'm talking about God. We're, we're not God. I said, God, go do this and go for that and, and go do this and go, go do that. that. That's not who God is. We, we've got to have such faith in God that when we put our petitions before him, we believe that he's got the power to respond to them by faith. But we also acknowledge that he knows what's best for us. We may ask for something that we don't get. But we understand all I know is right now. He knows all about my tomorrows. And if I'm asking for something that's going to mess up my tomorrows, guess what? We've got to have enough faith and trust in God to say, even though you don't do it, I still believe you're God. I still have faith in you. So the question before us today is, do you have the faith? Look at somebody and say, do you have the faith? The Gospel of Matthew teaches us about the ministry of Jesus Christ. And in his gospel, he shows him to be the king of the Jews and the savior of the world. And believe it or not, there's a lot of things going on in this ninth chapter of the book of Matthew. And some things happen even before we get down to our text. I just want to walk you through it here real quickly. The Bible teaches us that in Matthew chapter 9, he forgives a man of palsy of his sins, and then he heals him in verse number 6. He calls Matthew to become one of his disciples in verse number 9. He rebukes the Pharisees because he sat down with sinners and publicans, and they didn't like it. Verses 12 through 13, bookmark right there. If you're doing what God told you to do, don't be concerned about what people have to say about you. There's, there's just way too many folks criticizing the, the work of God because people are doing the work of God. You know why they criticize it? Because they ain't doing nothing. I would even encourage you when they start criticizing and talk about you, you just say, why don't you, why don't you come join me and help me do kingdom work? I am just so tired of people who just always yak, yak, yak about what's going on, but won't get up and raise a hand to help do kingdom work. Did I say that out loud? The Bible, I know. She said, put it on repeat. Concerning Matthew chapter 9. He answered John's disciples about fasting. In verses 14 and 15, he gave the parable of the garment and the bottles in verses 16 and 17. All of this is happening in chapter 9 of Matthew before he deals with the two blind men. He healed the woman with the issue of blood in, chapter, in verse 22. He resurrected the daughter of a certain ruler in verses 23 through 25. And he did all of this before the blind men showed up. 
Now there's something to be said about these two blind men. And that is, they had, and I'm going to say it this way because the Lord just gave it to me this way, they had enough sense to cry out to the Lord in the midst of their situation. You see, a lot of times we want to be quiet. We don't want nobody to know we're struggling. We don't want nobody to know we're going through. We'll even stay away from worship because we don't want nobody to know we're going through. How many people who are sick stay away from the hospital? How many people who are sick stay away from the doctor? I wish I had a witness. How many people who need a loan to do something stay away from the bank? We'll do all these other things, but when we find ourselves in trouble, we won't call upon the name of the Lord. Does it have something to do with our faith or the lack thereof? Do we feel like we've got the power to handle our situations and we don't need the Lord to handle what we're going through? For example, well, God, I'll call on you when I, when I get cancer, but I won't say nothing because somebody over here talking about me and, and they need to get their situation straight. I can't punch them in the throat, but God, I know you can handle them. I think I've said that enough. That's probably going to be on my tombstone. He always wanted to punch him in the throat. Lord, deliver me. <laughs> but these two blind men had enough sense to do what was needful and necessary to get their situation taken care of. So let's look at the text, if you will, and see what we can glean from it. Because you see, in order for you to see your faith in the Lord, the question is, do you have the faith? In order for you to see your faith in the Lord, number one, you've got to know the Lord for yourself. You've got to know the Lord for yourself. It would appear to me that these two blind men, and you got to be mindful, he, they were blind. They could not see. And some have said when one of our senses go away, the other one's heightened. They, they get better. So you got to understand that these two blind men must have been close enough to the action to hear what was taking place. I'm talking about all those things I just read in chapter 9. All those things that Jesus had done, knowing that he had healed the woman with the issue of blood and he resurrected the ruler's daughter. He must, they must have heard these things were going on. Now, historically, blind men were beggars on the side of the road. And they spent their days begging for handouts. And it's obvious to me that these two blind men heard what was going on and they recognized because Jesus had already shown that he's got power, they felt like Jesus had the ability to heal them too. But before any of us can get healed, before they could get healed, before we could get healed, we've got to know the healer. Mm. If you will, in verse 27, notice what they said or what they called Jesus. They said, thou son of David. They, they recognize him as the son of David. It's interesting because Jesus was, was coming into town, but <laughs> what, 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 what blows my mind is how the people of God sometimes can't see Jesus for who he is. But people outside the faith know who he is. And these two blind men acknowledge him as the son of David. You see, this title, if you will, acknowledges Jesus as the legal heir to the throne of David. 
And these two blind men addressed him as such because they knew he had the power to heal them. Y'all still with me? The Bible records for us that there was a lady who had a medical condition, talked about her a little while ago, that she just couldn't get any help with. Now, let's, let's understand something here. This woman had a condition, and she went from doctor to doctor to try to get the help she needed. I just made a statement. We get in our trouble, and guess what? We don't come to the house of the Lord. Amen. You do know that this is the spiritual hospital. Amen. And the doctor here has never lost a case. When I, when I was growing up back in Louisiana, there was a song that the choir used to sing. It was God Specializes. You see, in the medical professions, there's, a, there's some general practitioners who kind of dabble in a lot of things. But then you've got some of those doctors that specialize in certain areas, Brother Deacon. And some of them are, are cancer doctors. And some of them are brain doctors and some of them are feet doctors and some of them are body doctors and some of them just doctor doctors. My, my point being some they they only only deal with that one thing in particular. And so when you find out that there's an MD behind their name, you start asking them questions and oh, oh, slow down, slow down, slow down. I don't, I don't deal with ears. I, I deal with feet. You got to go talk to the ear doctor. So, so what am I saying? Jesus is the brain doctor. He's the eye doctor. He's the ear doctor. He's the throat doctor. He, he's the body doctor. He's the soul doctor. He, he can handle whatever you find yourself dealing with. And this woman went from doctor to doctor to try to get the healing that she needed. And then she realized the chief physician was coming into town. She made it a point to get to where the Lord was going to be by pressing her way through the crowd. And she resolved within herself and said in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 21, she says, If I may but touch his garment, I shall be made whole. Bookmark. She didn't say I might be. She didn't say possibly. She said, I shall. That's a word that is definite and really absolute. It will happen. And Jesus began to talk to her in Matthew 9 and 22. He says, daughter, be of good cheer. Thy faith hath made thee whole. You see, she, she thought she had to do something physical. If I could just touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. And Jesus is saying, you don't have to touch nothing. You don't even have to touch me. It's your faith. Your faith in me that hath made thee whole. And the Bible goes on to say, and the woman was made whole from that hour. You see, God has the power to touch, heal, deliver, and set free instantly, or he can take his time. But I'm thankful that it was very clear for us here. It says, in that same hour, and she was dealing with this situation for years. Yet in that same hour, because Jesus spoke into her life, and her faith responded to what he said, she was made whole from that very hour. I'm here to tell you today, the Lord has the power to do what nobody else can do. And because I'm talking about the Lord, I, I just need to help us understand something. If you want your healing, you've got to know the Lord for yourself. If you want your breakthrough, and some of us are on the edge right now waiting for that breakthrough to happen. If you want your breakthrough, you've got to know the Lord for yourself. If you want your deliverance, you've got to know the Lord for yourself. It's not going to come, as they say, by proxy. It's got to come by virtue of a personal 
and intimate relationship with Jesus. Let me throw this in real quickly. When we are standing before the Lord in judgment, there won't be any time for us to say, uh, excuse me, Lord, let, let me go over here and get the pastor real quick. Uh, excuse me, Lord, let me go get my mom and them. Because I know she, she had a relationship with you. Uh, excuse me, Lord, can I go get the deacon real quick? Because he used to call me once a month, and we, we know what, what that's like. I, I, just need, I just need somebody to stand here with me. We won't be able to do that. Why? Because we've got to stand for ourselves. And I just want to make this very clear. There's two lines. I know what line I'm going to be in. The question is, do you know what line you're going to be in? So we just got to ask ourselves the question, do you have the faith? Secondly, if you want to see your faith in the Lord, number two, you've got to ask the Lord for yourself. Verse 27, it says, And when Jesus departed, then two blind men followed him, and somebody else started crying and saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. Y'all didn't catch that. Maybe you did, y'all just real quiet. I said, when Jesus departed this, two men, two blind men followed him and somebody else started crying and saying. You see, in verse 27, if I get the media ministry to help me and possibly put it up, it says, when Jesus departed this, Two blind men followed him, crying. Right there I said, and somebody else cried, or somebody else said. That's not what the Bible says. It says, these two blind men opened up their mouths. It didn't, didn't, you know, crying in this sense is not to say that they were crying, you know, and their eyes were sweating or anything. No, it, crying means that they opened up their mouths to speak. And again, they had enough sense to speak for themselves. And they said, thou son of David, have mercy on us. If you really have the faith and you know God can do something for you, you've got to ask the Lord for yourself. Amen. Even though these two blind men heard about what Jesus was doing around them, they didn't wait for somebody else to ask the Lord for their healing. You know, it, it could have been something, you know, one of the disciples standing around and say, well, Lord, we got these two blind men here that they need to be healed. Would you? Would you? Would you hook the brothers up? That didn't happen. Because, number one, they were blind, so they didn't know who was around them. They just knew people were around them. And number two, they were blind, so they had to do something, so they opened up their mouths. And if you've got faith in the Lord, you've got to open up your mouth. I believe, and this is just me, I believe some people ask others to pray for them because they themselves haven't spoken to the Lord in a long time. And, and they don't want the fact that they haven't spoken to the Lord in a while to hinder the fact that they need the Lord's help at that moment. You see, I'm so glad the Lord don't treat us like we treat one another. Because you see, can I be real, y'all? Y'all know I'm going to do it. I just, I just love asking. I think that's just, just the, the polite thing to do. Talking about asking. You know how it is. I didn't take my glasses off for this one. You know how it is when you have people that you know and friends that you know and acquaintances that you know 
that you haven't talked to in five to ten years. But out of nowhere, they call you and ask you for something. They won't even ask you how you doing. But they will ask you for something. I'm driving this point home. And in our natural selves, we started thinking, man, I ain't heard from you in months and Sundays. I haven't heard from you since the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And you're going to call me and ask me for something? You see, that's how we, generally speaking, respond sometimes. Because we haven't heard from people in a long time. But when you got a real friend and, and a true friend, I mean, somebody who is, as we said back in Louisiana, your ace boon coon. You know, nowadays it's BFFs. But I mean, your ride or die, your, your, the, that person that you know, regardless, I'm going to be there, they're going to be there. That's just the way it is. When they call, it's not a problem. And when you talk to them, it's almost like you just pick up the conversation from where you were 10 years ago. Like no real time has, has passed. Why am I saying all this? That's how Jesus deal with us. Because you see, even if we have neglected to talk to him in a while, we can still call upon him and know that he still has the same power to bless us in what it is we need at that moment. We just got to clean some things up. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Because that just gets us right back into that good fellowship with the Lord. We've asked him to take care of the sin situation. Now the Lord can deal with me and I can deal with him. And because, because people haven't talked to the Lord in a while, now they want to ask somebody to pray for them. And I've gotten to the point, brothers and sisters, when, I ask, when people ask me to pray for them, I say, I need you to pray too. Amen. Amen. You know why? Because the Lord wants to hear from you. Amen. He don't mind us touching and agreeing, but he wants to hear from you. Because if you go back to Matthew chapter 9 and verse 27, the Bible says those two blind men started crying, saying, Thou son of David. What am I saying? They opened up their mouths and acknowledged the Lord for themselves. You see, God is very clear with us and has told us time and time again that if we want something from him, all we have to do is ask. Ask. Jesus made it very clear for us in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 7. And there it says, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. The Lord further went on in Matthew chapter 21 and verse 22 and said, And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. And that word believing, if you will, if we made it into a synonym, that's having faith. Believing. The thief on the cross couldn't get down, get baptized, get back up there to know that he was saved he just believed and all he said was when you get to your kingdom remember me he didn't say somebody else's kingdom he said when you get to your kingdom remember me 
And brothers and sisters, I've said time and time again that I believe your blessings are tied to your voice. And we have the individual responsibility of asking of God for ourselves. Now, I need y'all to follow me on this one. I personally do not condone gambling. Gambling. Because if you lose it all, is that making you a good steward with what God placed in your hands? It's like I, I have more faith in Saquon than I do God. And all Saquon is saying is, come unto me. All ye that have money. And then Saquon is saying, and I will be blessed. So I don't condone gambling. And I'm talking about asking. I'm talking about receiving. I don't condone gambling. But I believe, I believe, if somebody in here possibly would win big at the lottery. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't do the lottery, so I know it was pick six or pick three or whatever it is. You go in there and you tell them what numbers you want or you can say you pick the numbers. But I believe if you were to win big at the lottery, you wouldn't ask somebody else to go get your money. You would get up, get in your car, by faith, and go get your money. I said all that to say this. If that is indeed the case, then why would we try to send somebody else to get our blessings from God? Because you have to ask for yourself. You've got to have that interaction with the Lord for yourself. Because as soon as you begin that interaction and God begins blessing you, guess what? Your faith goes to another level. So when it came to Jesus, these blind men asked for themselves. And so much like those blind men, we too have to go to God and ask for ourselves. Almost through wrapping up. And lastly, if you want to see your faith in the Lord, number three, you've got to believe in the Lord for yourself. For yourself. Look at somebody and say, for yourself. Point to your, yourself and say, for yourself. For myself. I need to know him for myself. Again, a review of chapter nine of Matthew lets us know that experience had shown them that Jesus had the power to do something about their blindness. And I've learned that Jesus will never force himself on anyone. Amen. That, that's not how the Lord operates. You see, Jesus came down, according to Matthew 1, through 40 and 2 generations. He, came, he left heaven and came to earth. And when he got it, he said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He didn't say, you better come to me right now, otherwise. He said, come unto me. So again, the Lord won't force himself on anyone. But everyone must be willing to know the Lord in order to participate in his power. So if you will, let me, let me ask a question here. 
What do you believe about Jesus today? What do you believe about Jesus today? Here's, here's a few things that I think we need to be mindful of concerning Jesus. Number one, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ? Yes. The, the anointed one? Yes. Sent by the Father? Yes. To be the ransom for many? Yes. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ? Yes. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Yes. Do, do you believe that Jesus walked on water? Do you believe that Jesus turned water into wine at the wedding of Cana in Galilee? Do you believe that Jesus fed 5,000 men, not including women and children, with two fish and five barley loaves of bread? Do you believe that Jesus healed a man with a withered hand? We've got to ask ourselves some questions. Do we, do we really have faith in the Lord? Do you believe that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead? Do you believe that Jesus spoke a word and a fig tree withered up? You got to ask yourself what you believe. And more importantly, who you believe in. Because the Bible teaches us that after Jesus has spoken to the fig tree, the disciples saw it right in front of their eyes and couldn't believe what the Lord had done. Yes. Now, mind you, they're with Jesus. They're watching Jesus. They're listening to Jesus. They're seeing Jesus perform miracle after miracle. But when he spoke to that fig tree and it withered up, they couldn't believe it. They doubted Jesus. Help us, Holy Ghost. Jesus told them in Matthew chapter 21 and verse 21, he says, Verily I say unto you, if ye have faith, bam. Because they couldn't believe, they doubted, they couldn't believe it. He says, if you have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if ye shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be cast in the, into the sea, it shall be done. Can I help somebody here? A lot of times, when we talk about mountains, we think about physical mountains. I joke with people all the time because growing up in Louisiana, New Orleans is below sea level. That's why it floods there so much when the hurricanes come through. Below sea level. And it's flat land everywhere. And I tell people, the very first mountain I ever saw in real life was the Superdome. I'm just being honest. That was the biggest thing I had ever seen. What, what am I getting at? We think about mountains as the biggest thing that's happening. The biggest thing we see. We don't realize we have mountains in our lives. We've got mountains on the job. We've got mountains at home. We've got mountains in our financial situation. Can I be real, y'all? We got mountains concerning our kids. We got mountains when it comes to siblings. Mountains. We won't speak to those mountains. I said earlier, I believe your blessing is tied to your voice. We won't speak to those mountains and tell those mountains, be ye removed and cast into the sea. Can I be real? We even got mountains in the church. People we have issues with. People we have problems with. We try to be nice. We try to be kind. We try to be Jesus-like. And they hit one cheek and we turn the other cheek. And then they hit that other cheek and then we realize, wait a minute, I ain't got no more cheeks. Yeah. 
mountain be thou removed. And we've got to understand that we have those mountains. And I'm preaching to me too. We have those mountains because we haven't addressed them. We haven't said something about them. We, we haven't talked to those people, nor have we talked to the Lord. And then we walk around saying, man, I'm just having a bad day. Yeah, you got a bad day because you're not dealing with the issue in front of you that will make your day better. Now, after this message, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to really practice what I'm preaching. So y'all better be like what T.D. Jake said, get ready, get ready, get ready. They couldn't understand what was going on with the fig tree. Jesus had just killed the tree because the tree was not being productive. I just need to let that marinate. And so Jesus dealt with that tree that wasn't doing anything. They, the disciples, could not see, believe, they doubted what the Lord was doing. They saw it and still didn't believe it. And I believe that's why the Bible teaches us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7, for we walk by faith and not by sight. Because truly our sight can deceive us. It can definitely deceive us. So in closing, my brothers and sisters, in order for us to receive the promised blessings from the Lord, we've got to have the faith necessary to believe in the Lord. The writer to, of Hebrews said in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, it says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So when I think about Jesus, I'm reminded of what the Bible says about him. Because again, we've got to ask ourselves, do I have the faith? And asking ourselves that question, who do I have faith in? So I'm reminded of what the Bible tells me about Jesus. And it lets us know that he would indeed be born of a virgin. He would be given the throne of David. This throne, if you will, would be an everlasting throne. He would be called Emmanuel, God with us. Talking about Jesus, the Bible said he would be born in Bethlehem. Said that he would be worshipped by wise men. Some people say it was only three because they gave him three gifts when he was born. We got to think bigger than that, y'all. Just because he got three don't mean it was only three. And if we can bring this thing home, just because there's a hundred people in the sanctuary don't mean all 100 are going to bless the Lord when it comes time to give. Now, Lord. The Bible says concerning Jesus that his bones would not be broken. Even said that while he was hanging on Calvary's cross, that he would be stared on in death. People were staring there, standing there, staring at him while he was hanging on the cross. The Bible also says that he would be buried with the rich. You, you, you do know that that tomb that he was laid in was not, if you will, made by a poor man. Right. Joseph of Arimathea had money. And he was actually putting his own tomb in an area where other people had money. Now, what's interesting is they dead, they ain't got no money. But my point being, they had enough money to put the tomb with the other rich people. That's what the Bible says about Jesus. The Bible also said that he would be raised from the dead. How many other religious leaders have been raised from the dead? I'll wait. 
It won't take long because the answer is zero. Jesus is the only one who was raised from the dead. The Bible said he will ascend into heaven. And they said, why you look up gazing? This same Jesus who is going up in the cloud. Look at Acts chapter 1. You'll see it. Going up in the cloud. This same Jesus will come back the same way. So you got to be careful because there's some people walking around saying they're Jesus. And I said before, when they say that, you ask them, where's your cloud? Because that's how the Bible says Jesus is going to come down in the rapture. Where's your cloud? And truth of the matter is, because I'm talking about Jesus, he's coming back again one day. And you've got to have faith to know that he can handle what's going on in your life right now. You've got to have faith that when your eyes close for the very last time, Jesus is going to be the one who says, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. Y'all need to understand something. When my eyes close for the very last time, I'm not looking for Matthew to come knocking on my soul. I'm not looking for Mark, Luke, and John, Paul, Stephen, none of them coming back knocking for my soul. I know David was a good king and Solomon came behind him, but none of them can do for me what Jesus has already done. Jesus went to Calvary. What did they say? They hung him high and they stretched him wide. Right there on Calvary is where Jesus died. Y'all need to understand something. When I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, it was Jesus who picked me up, turned me around, and placed my feet on solid ground. Some people can do some things for you, but only Jesus can do everything for you. You got to ask yourself the question, do I have the faith in Jesus? Jesus Son of man Jesus Son of God Jesus I am the bread of life. Jesus, I am living water. Jesus, I am the door of the sheep. Jesus, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am talking about Jesus. Back home they said he's a lily of the valley. And he's a bright and morning star. Back home they said he's the alpha and the omega. He's the first and the last. He's the beginning and the end. At all points in between, I am talking about Jesus. Look at somebody and say, Pastor talking about Jesus. I want to make it clear who we're dealing with. And his name is Jesus. So do you have the faith? Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Matthew chapter 9 verses 27 through 31. I was blind, but now I see. Do you have the faith today?